washed away in your blood Too much to make sense of it all I know that your love breaks my fall The scandal of grace You died in my place on my soul Will live Oh, to be Just to know you, Jesus, there's no one besides you, forever the hope in my heart, oh,
Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Hillcrest Church. My name is Kurt Walters. I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here, and we're glad that you've come uh, to this discussion and presentation of the Human Sexuality Report. Uh, This started as an adult education thing for our church, and it's gradually grown, and uh, now it's going to be recorded on YouTube. So if you have people you know who are interested, uh, it will be recorded and can be watched later as well. But a welcome to you. There are restrooms down the hall, right out of the sanctuary, a little to your left, and there's also restrooms to your left before you get to the gym. Uh, And there will be refreshments afterwards as well, cookies and some water if you want to hang around and chat. We would love that. Let's uh, join together and let's ask the Lord for his blessing on this meeting. Holy God, we're so grateful to gather together. We're so grateful for the opportunity that we don't feel at risk for health or life to do so. We're so grateful for the people that you put together who have given so much thought and prayer to this report. And we're thankful for Dr. Wyma that he can join us tonight and uh, share some of his insights being on the inside of the whole process. We pray your blessing on him. We pray your blessing on this, uh, the discussion tonight, on the question and answer session to follow. And Lord, we pray that you'll bless our denomination as we navigate this difficult and complicated territory together. We ask for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you again for, for being here with us tonight. My name is Corey Naderveld. I'm also one of the pastors here at Hillcrest, and I get the privilege of introducing Dr. Jeffrey Wyma. Dr. Wyma is professor of New Testament at Calvin Theological Seminary, where he has taught for 30 years this year. Uh, there's, I've noticed there's several pastors in the room, many who have uh, been shaped and formed by his teaching, so we're just really grateful for his work and scholarship at Calvin Seminary. Uh, Dr. Wyma is an excellent communicator of God's Word, of the Bible. Uh, He has this uh, incredible ability to make the text come alive, all while helping you see the depth and detail in the text. In 2017, I had the opportunity to go on a study tour with Dr. Wyma in Turkey and Greece, um, and the teachings in that trip uh, on location have really shaped and really transformed the way I see God's Word and have been a huge influence in my ministry. He also leads study tours to Israel, Jordan, and Italy. To date, uh, he has published six books. The first five were dealt more with Paul as a letter writer and First and Second Thessalonians, and the latest released this past summer by Baker, The Sermons to the Seven Churches of Revelation, a commentary and guide. Uh, just a wonderful book, and we've been able to hear, I think, four out of the seven sermons here at Hillcrest and been blessed by that. He also does seminar- seminars for pastors and much more. He and his wife, Bernice, have been married for 38 years. They have four children and now eight, eight grandchildren, eight wonderful grandchildren. So Dr. Wyma is here today at the request of the Council of Hillcrest CRC. Uh, He's here to do what he does best, to lend his expertise and scholarship to serve the Christian Reformed Church. Uh, He comes as co-chair of the committee to articulate a foundation-laying biblical theology on human sexuality. He's here to help us understand what's in the report and what's at stake. So after the presentation, after the formal part of the presentation, there's going to be an opportunity uh, to ask questions. The way we're going to do that process, you'll notice in the pews in front of you, there should be a couple of white 4 by 6 index cards and some pens in the pews as well. So as we go throughout uh, the, the presentation, if something pops into your mind, you can write if you want to wait till the very end. You can do that, and then we'll ask you, we'll prompt you to pass them to the end of the rows. If you want to put them face down, that's fine. And then the person on the end of the row, you just got designated as the official card holder upper. Um, And so Pastor Kerr and Jim Holtrup will be walking around gathering those cards uh, during that portion. Um, I also want to take a moment just to thank Classis Grandville, our classes to the east, um, for co-sponsoring this event tonight. So thank you to them. And thank you to Dr. Wyma for being here tonight. So with for, no former, further ado, would you please help me welcome Dr. Jeffrey Wyma. Okay. 
So thank you, Pastor Kurt, for your warm words of welcome and your opening prayer. And thank you, Corey, for your um, embarrassing words. May, may God forgive you for exaggerating my accomplishments so much. And may God forgive me for enjoying it so much. So it's a, well, it's a pleasure. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a sensitive subject, so maybe I hesitate to say it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, but it's a very important subject and more than worth our time and energy. Our committee met many times for four years. And as we gathered together, and mostly at Calvin Seminary in this little room, sometimes we thought, does anybody know we even exist? Does anybody care? Um, well, subsequently, of course, people now know that we do exist, and maybe they care a little too much. Uh, but uh, it is good that uh, we can gather together and think carefully about a very important and uh, sensitive subject. The report is somewhat long. Uh, it's not our fault when you hear the mandate that was given to us. It's about 150 pages long and another 25 pages of appendixes. And so there's no way, of course, for me to kind of convey all that information to you tonight. And so I have maybe more modest goals, right? The first part of the goal is just to give you kind of the backstory so that when you hopefully read either minimally the executive summary of the report, only 10 and a half pages, or if you even better look at maybe not the whole report, but certain chunks of the report in detail, you kind of come to it already knowing ahead of time the big picture and thereby I think would be more easy to understand and appreciate and appropriate uh, the material. But I didn't want to give you just the background. There are two subjects that maybe somewhat, unfortunately, because all of the subjects that the report takes up are significant, but there are a couple of subjects, not surprisingly, that have garnered the most attention and they are, as you will not be surprised, the issue of homosexuality and then the confessional part. And so I'll say a little bit more about those, those aspects of the report rather than give you just kind of overview stuff. So I have a little simple presentation that will hopefully guide us through this discussion, and so we better begin. Now we'll see if this... Well. See, if we live by technology, we die by technology. I don't know if that was me or you, but we'll try it again. So anyway, we'll see in a second. So the backstory is actually 2016. There was an earlier study committee that meant for the normal three years, and three years means two years preparation, one early submitting it to the church, so they have a chance to evaluate it. And its focus was much more narrow and specific. You can see from the title that it was limited to same-sex marriage, and even more particularly, giving pastoral care. So that committee met for a couple of years, they gave, unfortunately, a uh, majority and minority report. So the committee itself wasn't uh, unified. And so Synod said, thank you for the report, and then immediately formed a new committee. And uh, they made some restrictions having to do with the new committee, and the mandate was broader, and, and that's where I kind of enter into the story. Now, the, the name is not at all user-friendly, Committee to Articulate a Foundation Laying Biblical Theology of Human Sexuality. Wow. So, somewhere along the line, it's been nicknamed, right, the Human Sexuality Report, or even more simple, the HRS Report. And so, those are names that you might hear bandied about, and you know that what it refers to. So, what did that Synod of 2016 do? Well, they said um, there should be certain kind of people on the committee. That's what they often do when they form a committee. But they did something that was somewhat unusual and somewhat controversial. They said everyone on the committee had to... Make sure you get the verb right. Adhere, right? Adhere to the denomination's existing position. Christian Reformed Church has an existing position, namely that there's a difference between orientation, same-sex attraction, and practice, the actual activity. And so all the committee members were required to adhere to that uh, distinction. Now, of course, uh, they didn't say that once we did our study, you had to continue to adhere or you couldn't come up with something new. And of course, the committee, I know from firsthand experience, all too painfully, often disagreed with each other. But some have complained that the committee was somehow a stacked committee, that its conclusions were a foregone 
uh, seen. And so I'm just acknowledging the complaint that has been made about the committee. Now, in response, Synod back then realized that people would say exactly that. So they said, we better hire or we better pick another person on the committee called a promoter fide. It sounds impressive, but it just means a devil's advocate. And so there's a person on our committee whose sole purpose was to give us a hard time. Well, not really, because it was a she, and she didn't give us a hard time, but she was supposed to keep us honest in our deliberations so that there would be, you know, nothing that would be hidden or overlooked. And I'd like you to believe, uh, I can't force you to, I'd like you to believe that some of us are pretty good scholars, and we never, even in our academic work and our church work, deliberately hide arguments as if we're somehow scared of them, right? Even if there were arguments I didn't like, I wouldn't even do that because that puts me and the committee in a vulnerable position. It's much better to acknowledge competing arguments because then you can kind of control a little bit the response to it. And so I'd like you to believe, right, that the committee was made up of a diverse group of people, and I'll give you their makeup in a minute, but who had to adhere to that existing position. And then there was a promoter fee day, the devil's advocate, who, by the way, signed the report, which means that she concluded that we were fair, right, and we didn't hide evidence, and we listened and took seriously all the things that she uh, brought to our attention. Now, who made up the committee? Well, it was a pretty diverse committee. We had four women and uh, seven men. We had five pastors with a variety of experience. We had uh, three members on the committee who were single, eight who were married, and very importantly, one member of the committee who was, or is, same-sex attracted. So one member on the committee is same-sex attracted, but also adhered to that denominational distinction between orientation and practice. I say that because this particular person, I think, gave and brought a voice of authenticity to the discussion that was crucial. Now, we met, right? The, the committee met, well, officially three times a year for four years. I'd, I'd, I'd like to say it was fun, but it wasn't. Um, I mean, the, serious, the subject was serious, and, you know, it was enlightening in a lot of ways, but it was hard. I mean, we were confronted with, with evidence, you know, that some of us didn't know existed, and we had to rethink things, and, and what is the proper biblical response? So we met a lot, and it wasn't easy at all, not just to meet, but to draft some conclusions and to put it into the report. And not only that, we met with a lot of people. I just stress that because some people who complain about the report say, oh, I wish they heard from some from the LGBTQ community. Well, I'm telling you, we did meet with lots of people from the LGBT community. So we met individuals who identified with that community. We met with people who have specialized ministry to those people. We, have, uh, we met with university chaplains, representatives from the CRC's chaplaincy and care. So we did get a lot of different voices, not all of which, in fact, a good many of which, did not adhere to the existing denominational position. So there were a lot of input from from academic sources, from reading sources, and from people that we met with. So now it's my first time going to the next slide, and was that me or you? We'll see next time again. So is, if there's anything unique about a report, maybe four features that I could highlight. One, a broad range of subjects. So that previous synodical committee I told you was very narrow, right? Just pastoral care for uh, same-sex marriage. We were given all kinds of things. So we were asked to talk about, and the report does talk about, pornography. Talks about gender identity. Yes, it does talk about homosexuality. It talks about singleness. It talks about cohabitation, premarital sex, polyamory. I mean, so there are a variety of different tasks that we were given, and and that's why they said we shouldn't give them normally three years like we do typically, but we'll give them five years. And so for four years we met, and then one year in advance in order to make sure that the church has a chance to read and kind of digest the report and then respond to it. Secondly, we certainly tried to give a gospel emphasis to the report. You know, we didn't want the report to be, you know, the traditional three-point minister sermon on sex. You know how it goes, right? Point number one is no. Point number two is no. Point number three is no, but with an exclamation mark on the end, right? 
So we wanted to avoid that kind of stereotype and say, now, wait a minute, we believe in the gospel, the good news of the gospel, how grace can transform sin. I mean, we ought to think carefully about how grace can speak to the issue of human sexuality because it's a gift of God. And, and, and so the report certainly tries, right, not to be no, 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 but in a very positive way to talk about how the gospel can result in a healthy view of sexuality. Three, and I want to stress this, we certainly attempted, and I believe we achieved, in giving a very strong pastoral focus. I just stress that too because I've seen at least one criticism where someone said, the report, you know, doesn't meet its mandate. It doesn't provide pastoral focus. Well, as I'll get a chance to explain to you, and you see a little bit in just a few moments, each of the major sections of the report has a whole section entitled pastoral care, and then there's like pages after it. And so there's quite a bit of pastoral care in the report. You may not like maybe what the actual content is, but don't complain that there's no pastoral care because the committee was thinking regularly. We had people who said, now wait a minute, you know, we want this to be a pastoral document, right? I mean, this is a, a real issue for many members of our church family, and they're not looking for some strident, doctrinal, uh, absolute position. They're looking for some empathy, some sympathy, some understanding, some practical guidelines. And I'd like to suggest to you that the report has quite a bit of that. And then the fourth somewhat, well, it is a very unusual thing because no other synodical report in all the years we've been around, I think, has done it, or at least not to this extreme. And that is, there are stories in the report, very short ones, but little biographical or autobiographical little vignettes. So different voices from within the church, from also the LGBT community. And um, they speak sometimes about the brokenness and how the church has failed them. So some of those are, are painful stories. But remember, we wanted to have a, a positive gospel emphasis. And some of those stories talk about how in a positive way people wrestled with these issues. But, you know, um, the kind of thing that's supposed to happen in terms of the church being a caring, compassionate community, that also was experienced. And so throughout the whole report are these authentic story. So those are at least four ways in which the report is, I think, somewhat uh, distinctive or unique. So when I go like this, that means that you have to, no, I don't know what that means. What is, well, point it over there. Well, I don't know. Well, that worked. There we go. We'll try that again. So there are different sections, there are different sections to the report, and most of the sections I'm going to present to you just what they are and just give you a just, just kind of say it exists, but I'm going to slow down for a couple of them and give a more specific uh, discussion. So preamble is the first part. It doesn't sound very exciting, the preamble, but actually the preamble tries to set the tone for the whole document. I just suggested to you that we were very much trying to give a very strong pastoral emphasis to the report. And the preamble says things like, um, well, you can see it there in, in, in just one little quote, but that the Christian Reformed Church has failed... It's failed to minister well to those who struggle, especially with same-sex attraction, but in other areas of human sexuality as well. And so it actually calls the church to confess and repent. Do people like confession and repentance? The answer is no, they don't. I mean, because that implies that we've done something wrong. But the report acknowledges that we've actually failed brothers and sisters in this regard. And, and in a pastoral way, it, it kind of challenges the church to kind of, re, to kind of recognize the failure, to repent of that, and, and then with the Spirit's help to do, uh, to do differently. Then there comes a, a pretty significant section that can be headed biblical theology. It seemed it, extremely wise, and I hope you would agree, that before we got down on specific subjects like pornography and gender identity and homosexual, we should first speak more generally about sexuality, right? Just what does the Bible say about human sexuality? And so, this is a nice overview following a rather well-known paradigm or outline in our circles, namely of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. And so a lot of key texts from both the Old and the New Testament are picked up and kind of summarized in this broad overview. This broad overview was presented to Synod 
uh, after year three. We kind of gave an interim report, and so the church has been able to see this for, uh, for some time. Now, after the biblical the- theological section comes, there it goes, right, a small section, so small that actually you might overlook it, and I'm going to slow down a bit to make sure that it gets its due. So the topics that I've already alluded to already that the report will treat about, namely pornography, gender identity, homosexuality, and the other, I hate to say, somewhat smaller subjects that the report also deals with, not surprisingly involve information and data from the sciences. And in fact, the committee, you can see that in the quote in in, in italics, right? We were mandated to find and to study the relevant conclusions arising from scientific and social scientific studies. And that's why on the committee we had a couple of social scientists, people who are experts in these particular areas. However, the Reformed faith in general, and the Christian Reformed Church in particular, has thought before on other topics about the relationship of science to general revelation, and then, of course, the relationship of general revelation to special revelation. We live in a culture in which uh, science is typically seen to be completely neutral, right? Actually, right, we're just going to follow the Science, because that's supposedly unbiased, all right? Well, Reformed Christians recognize that science is important, but it's an interpretation, a potentially fallen interpretation of general revelation. So we have to avoid the danger of putting an equal sign between science and general revelation, right? I'm just stressing that because, for instance, the Grand Rapids Uh, East report from a few years ago makes a statement where they're guilty of doing exactly that. Or to quote Lady Gaga, right, where in our culture when we talk about homosexuality, born that way, right, that involves or presupposes a certain degree of science. And so the committee is hearing that science and we're not trying to hide that science, but we're saying, now wait a minute, as important as the data from the social sciences and the other physical sciences are, they shouldn't be exactly equal with general revelation. And then not only that, general revelation has a particular connection to special revelation. Special revelation being the knowledge of God and the world through the scriptures. We belong to a tradition in which, well, the scriptures, what we say, sola scriptura. Sola scriptura doesn't mean we only listen to the scriptures and nothing else. Okay. No, it means we listen to everything, but on top of it all, right, what gets the last say, right, what gets the kind of authoritative place is the Word of God. And so I'm going on a little bit about that because our committee wasn't mandated to examine the relationship between science, general, general revelation, and so forth, because actually other synodical committees have already done that on other things that we've been debating about in the past. But again, so much today, people are controlled on issues of human sexuality by the science. And I'm saying we have to listen to the science, but we have to listen to it appropriately, right? Science is a potentially mistaken interpretation, and we shouldn't give it authority that is equal to or even surpasses that of Scripture. There we go again. So now, the committee has decided that we'd, we'd treat all of these subjects, you know, and uh, we'd, we'd have three big ones, three major ones. And notice the order in which we put them. We knew, right, that homosexuality would kind of be picked up as the most controversial, and we didn't like that fact. Why? Because we know that another topic of sexual immorality actually impacts a greater percentage of church members than same-sex sex does. And that's pornography. Pornography has a much greater negative impact on the body of Christ than debates over homosexuality. And so the report has a rather long discussion on pornography. And and we have the same tripartite structure in each of these topics. We start off with cultural context, right? What's been happening with regard to pornography lately? And uh, you're not surprising, the news is not very good, right? I mean, the percentage of people who use porn, the people, the percentage of people who are addicted to porn, the, the, the negative consequences from pornography are, are actually staggering. 
And I naively, and I just share that because maybe you have the same thought, I went into this discussion only thinking of pornography from the user side, right? The people who use pornography. But it became clear to me that just as troublesome is the production of pornography because that involves the physical abuse, mostly of women, but of some men, right? Uh, it also involves not just the simulation of sex, but the actual sex. And so the church needs to kind of wake up and recognize that pornography is a huge problem in the world and culture, and not surprisingly, in the church. And therefore, again, the gospel cries out to address this particular subject. And so the report does that. Then it goes on to biblical teaching. What does the scripture say about this? And then finally, look at pastoral care. Remember I told you that the report does have a lot of pastoral care. Each of these sections has a whole subsection in which very practical, very biblical, very compassionate advice is given to the church community as it seeks to wrestle appropriately with the topic of pornography. So a second topic is that of gender identity. Now this second subject is a very new topic, right? Even homosexuality the church has been thinking about and wrestling with for at least a good little while, not so with the issues of gender identity. And what that means is there's a lot less evidence. There's a lot less evidence from the social sciences and the physical sciences, and there's a lot less biblical reflection on this particular topic because the church hasn't been forced to wrestle with it at all. And so the committee right, uh, thought about this, and with the help of those who are experts on our committee in this area, there's an important distinction between disorders of sexual development, it should be DSD in abbreviation, and gender dysphoria. And then when we got to biblical teaching, well, we recognized, if I dare say it, a whimeism. I see a few students here, and I have a few whimeisms that, you know, they may be reluctantly have heard before and may be embraced, but it's the difference between shouting and whispering. Shouting and whispering. I'm not talking about decibel levels because I shout all the time, even though I say, Jeff, be quiet. But uh, I'm talking about the level of certainty with which Scripture addresses particular issues. So there are many topics, many topics that the Bible addresses in many places. And in those many places, the Bible speaks very clearly. And these are the things that we as Christians, and especially Christian leaders, should shout. I don't think anyone's going to disagree with that. But really, I'm setting you up for the other half, and that's the part I want to stress, and I stress with students too, and that is there are some topics the Bible doesn't talk about very often, and in the few places it talks about it, it's not very explicit or clear. And then these are the things that we should whisper. And we whisper not because we're wishy-washy on Scripture, but actually just the opposite. We so respect Scripture, we don't want to go beyond. We don't want to go be further than what Scripture, so to say, allows us to, to do. And so uh, what I'm saying, ultimately, is that the Scriptures don't directly or in a very explicit way address the issue of gender identity. It does have some important implications, and the report draws on that, but the report, therefore, kind of whispers in this part of the synodical report, unlike maybe another part of the report where Scripture shouts, all right? So the whole report is not all in the same decibel level, if you follow what I'm saying, right? Where Scripture is clear, the report tries to be clear and explicit, but where Scripture is less than clear, then the report tends to or tries to honor that distinction as well. And then pastoral care, uh, this is again a new area and uh, it's, a, it's a big burden for brothers and sisters in the church either for themselves as they wrestle with their own identity or especially with family members. And again, there's a whole section, not just a little paragraph, but a whole long section with very practical pastoral advice on how Jesus' followers ought to act in these situations. So now we get to the third and, as I've already admitted, the most controversial section of the report, namely dealing with homosexuality. And as in the other parts, 
of the report, there are three sections. There's the cultural context, there's the biblical material, and then there's the pastoral care. So our report, and I've already alluded to this at the beginning, namely that the Christian Reformed Church had an early report, even before 2016, way back in 1973. It was somewhat ahead of its time within the broader church community in recognizing the distinction between orientation and practice, orientation and practice. Scripture only speaks about practice, right, about acts, homosexual uh, or same-sex acts. And so we kind of just highlighted that fact, but we also had to because we said throughout we tried to adopt a pastoral position, one of, well, confession and repentance. And here the committee freely recognizes when we look at the Christian Reformed Church, because 1973 is a long time ago. We've had many, many years to think more about this and then to put some of this into action. And there's a sober recognition from the committee that the Christian Reformed Church has not really been the caring, compassionate community to same-sex attracted people, especially those who are committed to living a celibate or holy life that they have been, that is the church has been called to be. Now the next section, as you hopefully are expecting, is the biblical part. And, um, and here is where I'm going to slow down and look at a couple of issues with you, all right? So, so I'm changing gears a little bit here. But before I do, um, I just wanted to say that um, the full report that deals with homosexuality, or more particularly, the biblical part of the full report, it's only, well, it's only about 17 pages. And I know that when you hear the report, did you read the report? No, it's 173 pages. Oh. So actually, if you just want to know about what the biblical part of homosexuality section deals with, it's only 17 pages. Because we know that this is not a book or a dissertation or something for the academy. We know that people in the church need to read and understand this material. And so this is an issue which potentially will split the church. It's a pretty weighty issue. And I'm saying before you take an extreme position and say, I'm leaving, or whatever the case may be, your reaction is, take some time and read 17 pages, right? And try to wrestle with the biblical data. And Another option, I don't know if it's not coming up very clear in color, I have a website, and at the website, uh, I gave a talk a number of years ago, not so many years ago, but to a Baptist church, a mega Baptist church, on the issue of what does the New Testament say about same-sex sex, and they did a nice job recording it, and I had that posted at my website, and I might nuance my answers a little bit, especially in light of the further work I did on the committee, and if I were speaking to a Christian Reformed church, but that's an easy thing also if you want to pursue the biblical data, right? You just go there and in the privacy of your own home and in the comfort of your easy boy chair, right? You can kind of think a little bit and even hit pause once in a while if you had to kind of let that sink in and try to digest. So you've got the report, which isn't that long. You've got some video options and I'm giving just a little bit of that now, all right? I'm just giving you just part of what I can cover in the brief time that we're together. Now, those who advocate for the church changing its position, okay, the committee calls them revisionists, right, because they're trying to revise uh, the church's understanding. That's not a negative term. Maybe, Maybe they think it is, but it isn't. I mean, the church is always reforming, not to something new, but back to the Bible. And so these are people who say we've got to get back to the Bible, right? We have to revise our understanding of what the key text said or say about uh, homosexuality. And so um, what they commonly do is they bifurcate, they put a split between what Jesus said or didn't say and what Paul said. Now there's some problems with that, but I'm just following their argumentation. So I'm beginning over here, and the common argument is something like this. I mean, what did Jesus say about same-sex sex? And the answer is supposedly nothing. And if Jesus didn't say anything, well, maybe we shouldn't be all bent out of shape, or maybe it's not so important as you know, to require the church to split or so forth. I don't know if that sounds like a very convincing argument to you or not, but I want to suggest to you that it's not. So here are just a couple of quick answers for why this is not very compelling or convincing. First of all, can you go back one, please? I don't know, again, how that went. 
So Jesus was a Jew. I'm not saying anything new about that. And, um, well, you know, the time of the New Testament is filled with Jewish writings. And these Jewish writings typically involve big debates because they have big debates about this and that and this and that. And, and actually, they're pretty good at debating. And it's kind of striking that despite all the debating that Jews were doing during Jesus' day, uh, nowhere... Nowhere, not one time do they ever debate whether or not same-sex sex is okay by God or not. And so Jesus grows up into a world in which it's just assumed that same-sex or homosexuality, homosexual acts, pardon me, are contrary to the will of God, and, and, and we should assume that's his position unless he says otherwise. Jesus, of course, did say some things that were contrary to what Jews, other Jews said, but then they're recorded in the Scriptures. So that's at least a starting position. Secondly, uh, I don't want to offend anyone who's got a red letter Bible, okay? But um, actually, you know, there are good reasons uh, not to like a red letter Bible because somehow we're implying that the red letters are more important than the black letters. And sometimes people do that. Somehow the teaching of Jesus, red letters, is more important, we're not there yet, with the teaching of Paul, black letters, you see? And... uh, Evangelical Christians and Reformed Christians have always said that's a canon within a canon. It's like a little Bible within a Bible, as if the little Bible is more important than the big Bible. And, uh, and that's not really the right way to think of Scripture because all of Scripture is the inspired and authoritative Word of God. And, and what, we, what we hear Jesus say, or remember, He didn't say anything, or what we don't hear Jesus say is just as authoritative as what Paul actually says, right? So that's not a convincing argument either. Number three, this is the danger of argument from silence. So somebody doesn't say something and then you draw a conclusion from it. Sometimes I use this analogy, you know, let's imagine I'm talking for an hour and a half tonight and not one time I mention my dear wife Bernice. And then you walk away and say, Dr. Wyman never once mentioned his wife. I I wonder if he really loves his wife. That's an argument from silence, right? I'm not saying something you're drawing. So this is the big danger that you say Jesus didn't say something about homosexuality and then you're drawing a conclusion from that. And actually it's easy to show how dangerous that is because actually Jesus doesn't say anything about prostitution. Who's going to argue that Jesus is for prostitution, right? He doesn't say anything about uh, incest, right? Sex with family members, pederasty or bestiality. No, so, so these are all subjects that Jesus wasn't asked about because there was a common understanding. And so there's a third reason why we shouldn't be too influenced by the fact that Jesus supposedly didn't say anything. Actually, Jesus did say something. So it's not quite true to say that he didn't say anything at all. In one text, we read where Jesus says these are all the kind of things that defile a person. And in the list, there's a bunch of things. In the list, he calls, he he includes the word sexual immorality, singular in the NIV 2011. However, the original Greek has the word in the plural. So actually, more literally, you would say uh, sexual immoralities, Because Jesus knows that there's more than one way to be guilty of sexual immorality. Where would Jesus know all of that stuff? Well, he would get it from the Old Testament. You think Jesus knew the Old Testament, yes or no? Pretty safe bet that he did. So when he talks about sexual immoralities, right, he likely is thinking about texts we're going to get about just allude to quickly, like Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, which speak about, among other things, same-sex activity. And then this last one is kind of interesting, too. The Pharisees, and you know they're always giving Jesus a hard time, they came to him with a question about divorce. And then when Jesus answers them, you can see the letters in red, he quotes not just from uh, Genesis 2, 24, but also from Genesis 1, 27. Why is that important? Because in, one, in Genesis 1, 27, we have a very unique phrase where it says he made them male and female. Jesus doesn't have to highlight in an answer to divorce that he made them male and female unless Jesus is assuming that in a marriage, a marriage involves a person who is or a couple who are male and female, right? And so actually this text 
It's not an explicit teaching, but it clearly reveals the fact that Jesus assumes a marriage is between a male person and a female person. So remember, the argument from Jesus, he didn't say anything, it's not a big deal, and therefore we shouldn't make it a big deal, is actually not a very weighty argument at all. So there's another argument, and so we leave Jesus behind and we go to Paul, all right? And so let's see quickly what Paul says. So Paul, like Jesus, was a Jew. And did Paul know the Old Testament, yes or no? Uh, There are a bunch of texts that says he knew it really, really well. He was exceeding far beyond others, and he belonged to the Pharisees, a very conservative party, because they so wanted to appropriate the Old Testament laws of holiness to, to God's people. And so we should assume, we should assume that Paul has a kind of very conservative Old Testament attitude when it comes to Uh, human sexuality. And that's what we find. So forget about homosexuality for a second. Let's see if it goes ahead here, right? Uh, Go back one, please. All right. So when you look at Paul's, just just quickly, you can see a text from 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 5. Next slide, please. And then you have 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 6. Next slide. Uh, Galatians 5.19 and Ephesians 5.3, if you go back and look at the content of all of these verses, they don't say anything about homosexuality, but it just talk, it talks about porneia, right, sexual immorality, and it's pretty clear that across these different letters, remember, the difference between shouting and whispering, so here we have a number of texts that are all pretty clear, and, and so we should just assume that's Paul's position, unless unless he thought otherwise, and if he thought otherwise, he probably would have been clear about it. So in general, we make the observation that that's Paul's position, but now let's turn to uh, the three New Testament texts that deal with same-sex activity. Maybe that's not so clear to you, but there, there aren't many texts in the Bible that deal with homosexuality because, well, it really wasn't an issue for the people of God throughout their history, and so therefore there was no need for biblical authors to address that specific issue. And so as a result, we have just three references, and, and in none of these references, homosexuality is the focus. It's not like Paul sat down and said, I better say something about homosexuality. No, they're just kind of casually mentioned in larger discussions. But those are the three texts that we have. And interesting, I'm just going to stand over here because remember, this is the so-called shouting side. These three texts, I'm going to suggest to you, are clear, consistent, and therefore compelling. But I'm supposed to be over here for Paul, so I'll go back over to here for Paul for a minute. And the first text has to do with two words. All right, I'm just looking at my watch. I have a little bit of time. I could lose you, so I'm just warning you. I'm going to get kind of technical. I'm going to get kind of geeky or New Testament eggheady here in a minute, so brace yourself. You need your, your intellectual ability on high alert right over here, because it's just, but, but it's important to get this right. So in this list, there's a vice list. All these things are that will disqualify people from inheriting the kingdom of God, and in the middle of these lists are two words, two Greek words, because Paul wrote in Greek, that do deal with same-sex sex. sex. Now, you wouldn't know from the English translation there are two words because they're rendered in bold, right, with a bunch of words. But the larger context is this. Paul says, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be conceived, neither, and here comes the list, sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor, here's where you have the two words, Men who have sex with men, we'll come back to that in a minute, uh, nor thieves, nor uh, greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So we ask ourselves, okay, Jeff, those are the two Greek words that are written in English, malakoi and arsenikoitai, and you just say, well, just Jeff, tell us what those words mean, and then we'll know what Paul was intending to say. But another wimism, if I might dare say that, my students know well is, Every translation involves interpretation. Every translation involves interpretation. How you translate this term will actually, in some degree, decide how you interpret these words. Now, first, I'm going to put on my opponent's hat for a minute. What do the revisionists typically say at this point, okay? Well, um, I think it's the next slide over here. They say, we don't know. All right. And you can see here a quote from David Gushy. Maybe one, one more closer uh, to, uh, to home, but our 
Calvin University philosopher, um, Well, I'm, well, I'm ahead, I have this, I'm getting old where I forget names. It's kind of embarrassing, okay? Maybe I shouldn't mention his name. Anyway, he's, he's kind of widely respected and he stands up and gives talks about this and he says something, I've heard him say this. He says, New Testament scholars have no idea what these two terms mean and therefore we shouldn't give too much weight to them, right? How can we give weight to words in which we're not sure what they mean, all right? So I'm trying to say one answer is people say we don't know what the words mean and therefore, well, we shouldn't put too much weight on this text. Another revisionist interpretation. So, so again, people who want to change, they say we do know what it means, but it means what? All right, so now we go to the next translation. Oops, maybe I hit it again. Go back one, please. So they say the first word refers to pederast. Maybe you know the word pederastry. It refers, although it's misunderstood often, it refers to an older man having a sexual relationship, not with a boy. Okay, that's what's often misunderstood. But with a, shall I say, a youth, maybe 13 to 17, something like that, all right? Pederasty. And before I go to the second term, or probably the revisionist would say, now wait a minute, the older man, because he has a position of power, right, is abusing that power and therefore having sex with this younger person, right? So what they're saying is, not only does the word mean pederasty, but the real problem here is an abuse of power, right? The older person is taking advantage of the younger person. Oh, the second term, they would argue, refers to male prostitutes. And so this is referring to a person who actually abuses themselves. They sell their body for sex. So if, if, notice I said if, if that's the right way to translate, then you could go on and say, of course Paul doesn't say that, but you could go on and say Paul is not against all forms of same-sex activity. He's just against abusive forms of same-sex activity. Did you catch that difference? Do I need to say it again, right? So that would open the door to, often the phrase has been used, uh, monogamous, long-term, same-sex relationship. So the argument goes, right? So either one, we don't know what these words mean, and therefore, I guess we'll just have to forget about these texts. Or two, they mean these things, and the real problem that Paul is addressing is the abusive nature of the relationship, and that means that if there's no abusive relationship in a same-sex relationship, that's maybe not so bad. That would be acceptable. So the argument goes. So what should we say in response? All right, there's a person who says that. So I try to, in the report, we try to quote people like in their own words, right? So we're not trying to put words in someone else's mouth. You can see in the report where we actually cite the people who claim these things. So here comes response number one, and I wouldn't have to say response number one if there weren't two, three, and I hate to say it, even four. I told you this is the technical part, but actually this is important because how many texts are there that address not many, right? And you need to know whether they're clear, consistent, and compelling, right? Whether they shout or whether they're so unknown that we can only whisper. So here's the first response to that argument or claim. The first response is, if, again, if Paul were only against abusive forms of relationship, right? If he was only interested in pederasty, uh, he, there are a lot of Greek words which actually he could have used. You can see our English word pederasty comes from a Greek word, which is almost the same. And there are two other very good Greek words which refer to the older person and the younger person in this uh, same-sex uh, relationship. And so if Paul were thinking, as it is claimed, why didn't he use those terms? And then we wouldn't be so confused, right? So that's one weakness with the argument. Paul doesn't use those words, and therefore it doesn't seem like that's what he was intending. Here's a second response. You've heard of the expression, interpreting Scripture with... Scripture, isn't that what you're going to say, right? So there's another text. Remember, there are three New Testament texts. There's another text from Romans, and it's not that long, but it's longer, and it's clearer, and that other text from Romans can help better understand what this two words, remember, we're just talking about two words in Greek mean. 
So the text in Romans, one of the texts in Romans talks about women having sex with other women, a lesbian relationship. Why is that lesbian relationship in Romans helpful in understanding what those two words in 1 Corinthians mean? Don't lose me. Because This pederasty relationship in the ancient world was only between men, only between an older man and a younger man. There is no such a thing about an older woman with a younger woman relationship. So in Romans, Paul clearly is referring, therefore, not to a kind of pederasty relationship between women because it never existed. He's just talking about two women who have sex together, and he lists that among things that Christians should not do. And so that would suggest that in Corinthians, same Paul, same author, right? He probably has the same belief. He's not talking about this abusive relationship, but he's also just talking about two men who have sex together, and he thinks, or he doesn't think, I mean, he's claiming that that activity is not, um, not okay. And another way in which the Roman text helps us understand the Corinthian text in another verse from the Roman text, we read that, that Paul says, they were inflamed with passion, quote, for one another. That for one another is important because that suggests that Paul is putting blame not just on the one person in the same-sex relationship, but in, you're supposed to say both, okay? Don't be afraid. Okay, that would be nice. Then I know you're awake. Okay, both, all right? You see, and so that destroys, remember, the revisionists say, Paul's not against, he's just against abusive forms, right? Because, you see, Paul, you know, we can't blame the abused, weaker, younger person, right? But Paul is not thinking about that. In Romans, he, he says, in a, in a same-sex relationship, right, they are uh, both inflamed for passion for another. He, he holds both of them as being uh, culpable. Response number three I go like this, and did you hear the echo, echo, echo of the Old Testament, right? And, um, and most of us don't because we don't know the Old Testament very well. What about Paul? I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you think he knew the Old Testament? And he knew it really, really well. And I didn't give you in Greek those two Greek words yet, those two Greek words. The second of that Greek word is a, is a word, you can see it on the screen there, are synakoitai. And where did Paul get that word? Well, he got it almost certainly, there's some debate, but the wide consensus, the by far the majority view, is that it goes back to the Leviticus text. In fact, if I go ahead right there, you can see in red is how the Greek would be written in English, and then the translation is underneath. Look at the bottom one, if you can, from Leviticus 20.13. Even if you don't know Greek, look at the second line, and and I see in red, it's not so clear for me up front, and the letters are squished together somehow with the computer over here. I didn't send it in that way. But anyway, I see arsinokoitai. And so Paul, in the two words, one of the two words from 1 Corinthians 9, seems to be echoing, echoing something from Leviticus in the Old Testament. Now you say, why is that important? Well, because when you go to Leviticus 18.22 or Leviticus 20.13, it does deal with same-sex sex, sex, and there it involves all forms. You can see there in Leviticus 20.13, both of them have done what is detestable, both of them. In other words, the Old Testament puts fault on both participants, not an abusive one because, you know, doesn't not the weaker or the, the abused one, right? So that means that when Paul is echoing that Old Testament text, it doesn't mean what the revisionists say. He's only thinking about the abusive hierarchical relationship. But again, it looks like Paul is just saying in general, in a comprehensive way, when one male has sex with another male, right, that is uh, inappropriate behavior, not qualifying one for membership in the kingdom of God. Now, I did say there were four, and so here comes the fourth one. I'm just pausing for a little bit to give you a mental break because we're almost done. I mean, there's a little bit more, but this is actually kind of important because remember, people are making big claims that supposedly we don't know what these words mean or they mean something that therefore would allow for monogamous, long-term, same-sex, non-abusive relationships. I raise the question, why does Paul have two words here? for the same-sex relationship? Why does he have not just one? Why does he use two words? Is there something significant about these two words? And the answer I suggest to you is yes. 
You see, in the ancient world, sometimes, you know, I should backtrack a little bit. Revisionists sometimes say, you know, in the first century, you know, they were very uh, acceptable about homosexuality, unlike us today or something. That's not really true. Yes, there were same-sex acts, but they had to be distinguished. There was a huge difference between a man who, and I don't want to offend anyone, but I just say it this way, a man who penetrates another person. In the ancient world, honor and shame are like the biggest values. We don't understand that here in the West because we're frankly shameless. To a large extent, I'm afraid. But anyone who's traveled in the Middle East still today knows honor and shame are of a huge, right? Okay, so in the ancient world, it was considered okay if you were a man and you penetrated another woman or another man. That didn't matter, right? Because you're playing the male active role. However, it was considered shameful in Paul's day if you were a man and you allowed yourself to be penetrated, to play the female role, right? Do you understand the difference? So Paul lived in a world, the Romans lived in a world, the Corinthians lived in a world where if you were a man and you penetrated another man, well, that's okay. There's no shame or dishonor in that, right? Oh, but if you allowed yourself to be penetrated by another man, that was considered shameful. That was the attitude of Paul's day. Paul comes along and says something different, right? Paul says, yes, I agree that a person who allows himself to be penetrated, the, the passive person in a same-sex relationship is not appropriate, but he would disagree with this culture and say the one who does the penetration is also wrong. So why does Paul pick these two terms? The simple answer is he wants to identify both partners, we'll say the passive and the active partner in a same-sex relationship. And if you don't believe me, then look at the footnote in two leading translations. Have you heard of the NIV? Anybody heard of the NIV? Oh, yeah, it's okay. A small, obscure translation. Or the ESV, right, is another very... Interestingly, I don't know if one stole from the other, they have a little footnote. Okay, and look at the footnote. I put it in blue. So their translation is men who have sex with men, but they want to explain it to you, right? They, they recognize that's not what the Greek actually says, so they have an... Explanation, the words men who have sex with men translate two Greek words. Does that sound familiar to you? Anybody tell you about these two Greek words recently? Okay. Oh, that refer to the passive and active participants in homosexual acts. All right? So that footnote in both those translations basically echoes the point that I'm trying to make now. Now, I've got to start bringing it to a close, but just a few more comments. All right? Um, I'm going to skip over uh, that, I guess. I'm going to have to skip over some other things, right? I, uh, remember the three texts, and so one of those terms, or synechoita, also occurs in 1 Timothy 1.10, and you might want to have a chance to see how that also fits into what I've already told you about. And then thirdly, of course, we have uh, the Romans text. So the Roman text is really important. Why? For three reasons. One, it's longer than the other text. Two, it's the only reference in the Bible to sex between women. So there are a number of texts, not a lot, but a number that deal with homosexual activity. This deals with lesbian behavior, and so that's a kind of an added feature of this text. And then third, and most importantly, is the argumentation. You see, the first Corinthian text and the first Timothy text, it's clear that you're not supposed to do it, but the Bible doesn't say why. Right? It just says don't do that or it's wrong. Here in the Roman text, they give a reason why. And so the Roman text is important for that. So um, if I go ahead, <laughs> all right, uh, I, I, I hesitantly skip over the text, but uh, I hope you know this text of Romans 1, 24 to 27. It's not hard, of course, to find and read for your own. But let me give you a com one common argument that the revisionists say. So this is just one. There are more, and we won't have time to do any more. The revisionists come along and say, what Paul is against in this text is uncontrolled passion, uncontrolled sexual passion. We have a good English word for that, by the way. It's called lust. But anyway, that's what Paul is talking about, right? He's talking about uncontrolled or very excessive lust. And that's important, they would say, because 
once you take away the excessiveness of the part, then Paul says, according to this interpretation, I wouldn't have a problem with it. So they argue that these were heterosexuals, right? They were attracted to the opposite sex, but they were so inflamed with passion or lust that they went against their nature and they had sex with not an opposite sex member, but a same-sex member, right? And so they argue that, um, again, if you had heterosexuals or even homosexuals or lesbians, right, without that excessive passion thing, right, Again, monogamous, long-term, uh, same-sex relationship. Paul would be okay with that. I mean, that's how the argument goes. All right. So how do we respond to that? Right, here's a quote from James Bronson, who just retired. He's a professor at Western Seminary in Holland, right, in the RCA. And you can find, again, the report quotes these people in their own words, right, because that's only fair to do. So what do we respond? Well, context is king. So you have to look at those words in the larger context of Romans 1. What's going on in Romans 1? Well, the first part of Romans 1, because it's going to get to Romans 3.28, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All means not only Greeks, but also opposite of Greeks would be Jews, all right? And he's going to say something to the Jews, but he starts off with the Greeks. And from a Jewish point of view, you have to if, if I'm a Jew and I'm thinking about, you know, uh, about Greeks, I kind of roll my eyes and go, huh, you know what Greeks are like, right? They're always guilty of two sins, like they're two biggies. One is idolatry. Remember, Jews, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, by contrast, they worship all kinds of gods, right? That's the big sin. And secondly, the sin is porneia, the sin of sexual immorality. Morality. And so in chapter 1, Paul's not teaching about homosexuality, but he trots out these two sins. One is the sin of idolatry. They're worshiping created things rather than the creator. And secondly, he trots out the problem of sexual immorality. And it's in that context that he talks about women having sex with women and also men the same way. Now, here comes the important distinction. Right? What Paul is talking about, now think about idolatry for a minute. Idolatry is not a problem of excess. The Bible and Paul would never say, a little bit of idolatry is okay, just make sure it isn't excessive idolatry. Do you, you see? That doesn't work. All idolatry is sinful and wrong, okay? So the same thing would be true now when Paul talks about sexual immorality. It's not like a little bit of sexual immorality is okay, it's just when you have this excessive passion, it would be bad, right? The same thing is true for his comments about the sexual activity. And so it's not a very convincing interp alternate interpretation. Now there are more alternate interpretations of Romans because it's such a big text, but I clearly don't have the time to talk about it here. And that's maybe where you can read the 17 pages in the report or maybe watch those videos as you wrestle through those arguments. So let me go a little bit further here. You can see that, again, there's a lot more to say. Now, let's imagine that you're here tonight and uh, you're not really happy with what I'm saying because you think that somehow I had to adhere, right? I mean, I'm not open to other interpretations. And if there were some other scholars, better scholars, right, they would come to a different interpretation. How can I convince you that what I've said is at least worth seriously considering? Maybe nothing. But here's my attempt, right? So I found an expert on the issue of human sexuality in the ancient world, but he is a true liberal, Okay, so I found someone with whom I don't agree with and isn't like orthodox at all, and he, this expert on sexuality in the ancient world, agrees with my interpretation of these texts. His conclusion is, of course, is against same-sex sex. Of course he is. But why should we listen to Paul? He's just wrong. Well, I, I, I mean, that's what he says, right? So what I try to do is to show, and I've got, and I've, I sometimes joke about him, I, you know, because he's written like, I've only got, I only had room on the screen for four of his books. He's written like eight books, all dealing with sexuality in the ancient world. So he's very, very knowledgeable. He's widely recognized as a, as a you know, New Testament scholar, you know, uh, steeped in the literature and the beliefs of that day. And again, he says that the traditional church's interpretation, namely 
that same-sex sex is not accepted, right, is of course that's Paul's position. But he just thinks that Paul is wrong and we shouldn't listen to him, all right? Well, you can see that I've had to kind of go over a lot of things. So here's an important point I want to I wanna make. Um, I'm afraid that the Christian Reformed Church's treatment of women in office has not set us up very well for the discussion of same-sex sex. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? The Christian Reformed Church has seemingly an unusual position that, wait a minute, there are biblical texts, some biblical texts that seem to prohibit women's role in ecclesiastical offices, and there are other texts that seem to permit it. And so actually the Christian Reformed Church talks about two different tra- strands, right? Both of which in a sense are legitimate, don't do great violence to the interpretation of Scripture. And a lot of people say, well, if we did that for women in office, why don't we do that for homosexuality, Right? you got people like Wyma and the Human Sexuality Report. They have one position, and then you've got, you know, the other camp, and why can't both exist? So I'm a little bit nervous about, and I understand how that could easily happen in light of our previous treatment of women in office. So I want to say to you that, if I can do over here the next slide, all right, Oh, no, uh, well, sorry, go, well, you can see it on the screen too. It's not a 50-50 debate. So yes... There are alternate interpretations of the key text. In fact, I've given you some of them. But that ought not to surprise us. I mean, you pick almost any subject of the Bible and you can find someone, maybe even two or three, who have a different interpretation. So that's not surprising. So, yes, there are two interpretations, but they're not two, big word, not two equal interpretations. In other words, when you look at the wide range of scholarship on these texts, right? Yes, there are some dissenting voices, but it's a small minority for the revisionist, and there's a huge majority for the traditional position. And not just conservative, but I already told you, even some radical liberal, right, scholars say, of course that's the church's position, it's just wrong, or we shouldn't do that. So again, I'm just trying to prepare you for that kind of argument, and I don't think it's legitimate. And that leads to a little phrase uh, uh, that, that comes up in the report. I've used it already tonight, and that is, the biblical teachings are one, clear. Clearer than on this discussion of gender identity, right, where we were whispering. Here, the texts are clear, and they're consistent. We didn't have time to go through all the three New Testament texts. They're consistent with what the Old Testament say. And as a result, the biblical teaching is clear, consistent, and compelling. Now, I remember pastoral care. I, I'm a little bit nervous, and I am genuinely nervous that people say, oh, you know, we get all this academic stuff, and you're not fulfilling, you know, the very sensitive situation that family members are going through. And so, again, I say to you, there's a whole long section on pastoral care. And let me go one step further. The first words in pastoral care are not to people who have same-sex attraction. You know, the first words in pastoral care are addressed to the church. Because remember, I've already said to you, right, the committee says the church is at fault, right, in the past. And so we need to repent and change. And so the first pastoral care is addressed to the church. What should the church do in this situation? The second word is still not addressed to same-sex attracted to people. It's addressed to leaders in the church because leaders in the church are in a unique position to give guidance on this particular subject. And then finally, the last part of the pastoral care is now what, what kind of words of encouragement and pastor advice can we give to those who are same-sex attracted? So I'd like to say that all of this discussion, too, is very much intended to provide a pastoral guidance to our denomination. Well, you can see I've misjudged. Well, I wasn't surprised about that. There are other topics, okay? Singleness, just very quickly. Our denomination is especially bad. We used, only a few years ago, we counted people by how many what we had in the church, how many families, okay? At least we've at least got rid of that. Somehow we think of singleness as weird or strange. Well, actually, the text and the report highlights them in the New Testament are pretty clear about holding up singleness, and so we have to change our view on that. Premarital sex. We're guilty of hypocrisy, brothers and sisters. Some of us are all bent out of shape because, oh no, we're going to maybe somehow change our view on same-sex sex, and we've been just closing our eyes to premarital sex. 
or cohabitation. And so, you know, we're just opening ourselves to being hypocrites on this particular matter, right? So if you're going to affirm the one, right, the prohibition of same-sex sex, well, then you've also got to affirm the other, the inappropriateness of premarital sex and cohabitation. Polyamory, uh, you may not know what that is. It's consensual, non-monogamous relationships. Uh, it's, it's hard to say, and you can think about it, consensual, non-monogamous. I mean, it sounds weird or strange, but it's in our culture, and it's invading the church. There's a whole section on Song of Songs. Remember when I said that we wanted a positive spin to the report. How does the gospel positively impact human sexuality? And so we kind of end with a reference to the Song of Songs, and then I have to say something about this last one, and it's the last thing, right? And then we'll have Q&A section, and it has to do with confessional status because that's also very controversial. First of all, we, that is the committee, didn't decide to make a statement. We were asked, we were tasked, is this issue a matter of confessional status, all right? So it's not like the committee is asserting its position. We're just trying to do what the church told us to do. We looked at this issue and we said yes. Why did we say yes? from maybe the smaller to the largest, although they're all significant. It's one, we looked at the global church. We're not the only Jesus followers in the world, although sometimes we're so preoccupied with ourselves. We're blind to our brothers and sisters around the globe. And when you talk to them and ask them what their attitude and what they think the Bible says about this, it's, it's pretty strong. And so we ought to think about our witness to the broader church. Two, we're not talking about a particular person or a particular act. We're talking about the official teaching of the church, right? I mean, are we going to go to the pulpit and say, you know, the Christian Reformed Church says that it's okay? I mean, is that going to be? so? There's still room for discipline and discipleship and so forth, but that's really what we were getting at. Three, the historic teaching of the church reflected in our confession. I have the Heidelberg Catechism up there because there's a question and answer that deals with adultery, right? Adultery. So just like murder, right? The catechism deals with murder, and it doesn't say that murder is bad, but you can still, you know, you can still maim your neighbor or you can do this or that. I mean, it highlights in a very broad way, right? I mean, there are lots of ways in which you can harm your neighbor. And the same thing is true then with uh, adultery, right? and so forth, right? So that um, there are lots of ways in which we can, so to say, sin uh, or act inappropriately with regard to our sexual conduct. But the fourth one is really the biggest. So I'm going to stand over here because I've been doing it all night. Whenever I say clear, consistent, and therefore compelling, all right? And so that really is the ultimate reason why the committee thought that this subject was of importance. The scriptures say that it's important, and therefore, um, the church ought to recognize that status, even though that has some awkward or significant consequences. Well, I'm finally coming to an end. And so uh, we have at least 15 or maybe a little bit more since I was too long, if you're willing, for Q&A. And so I'm going to turn it over to Corey and Pastor Kurt, right? And this is your chance to put those questions in, and then we'll see if we can cover a number of them in the time that we have left. Thank you. Uh, if you haven't yet, if you have a question, write it down, pass it to the middle, uh, and then just kind of wave at us, and Pastor Kurt here will, will grab them. Um, got some here already for us. Okay. Um, I want to start with uh, this question. Recently, it was posted on the CRC Network site um, and signed by the all of the congregational ministry directors, I'm going to read a quote and ask you to re, uh, respond to it. It says, With something as complex as human sexuality, we must begin with a humble admission that no matter how much we think we accurately judge the true meaning of Scripture, we only scratch the surface of understanding. We can be convinced of the righteousness of our own cause, but when Christians strive to win rather than to follow Christ, they abandon not only Christ's call for unity, but also the way of Christ. This is from some denominational employees just a couple of days ago. And there's a lot to react there. I originally was going to read that because I wanted you to talk about whispering and shouting, but I should have anticipated the Wyma-isms there. But is there more you want to say about the perspicuity of Scripture? Is there anything maybe about the the dichotomy of love and unity and truth and what they call winning for our own cause. Well, again, 
I, need to, I haven't heard the questions ahead of time, so I need to hear a little bit to maybe accurately uh, respond to it. But what I hear briefly is, one, a call to unity, right? And Scripture shouts the call to unity. So I'm not denying that. But again, um, the same Scriptures that shout the call to unity speak pretty clearly on other matters, right? And yes, human sexuality is complex, but I'd like to suggest already the report does make, does recognize some areas are complex and maybe there should be more whispering and maybe more flexibility in terms of acting it out. But there are other parts that speak quite clearly and therefore maybe the response should be quite clearly. Also, far too often there's a, a, a dichotomy, right? A, a split between uh, truth and Love, right? Love and truth and so forth. And that's a split we don't find in the scriptures, right? Uh, Paul talks about speaking the truth in love. And um, if you look at Second John, it's just a little letter, but Second John at the beginning has love and truth and love and truth and love and truth because, again, those two things belong together. And I'm, I'm always a little bit nervous, right? And when people try to hold up one at the expense of the other. So, yes, I'm not eager for a split. It always saddens us when we see the church not bearing witness, right, to the reconciliation that ought to characterize our, our body. But our unity has to be grounded in something, right? Our unity can't be because of our ethnic background or, you know, our socioeconomic status. It has to be on our beliefs, our convictions, if it's going to be any substantive, right? And so I've suggested already, you know, uh, that the scriptures are at least clear enough for there to be some substantive truth for us to form a unity around anyway. Thank you. I got a couple more here, and I think Pastor Kurt's looking through some others there. But uh, on pages 114 through 121, the committee's report offers pastoral advice to churches with people who have same-sex attraction. That advice is consistent with Report 42 from 1973 and consistent with Synod 2002. That advice is that churches should provide fellowship, hospitality, warmth, and belonging to same-sex attracted members and guests. The committee's report encourages invitations to worship, small group, and fellowship, as well as giving positions of service and leadership to these persons, on page 116. We understand the CRC's position is one of welcoming, but not affirming. But what advice do you have for pastors, councils, and churches who want to take those pastoral considerations seriously? So I, I like the quote because, of course, it's affirming what the report says. And it highlights something I've tried to say throughout the evening. And I'm a little bit nervous with all my biblical arguments, you know, on the text so to say, highlighting the, uh, the sinfulness of same-sex sex, that you haven't heard enough of also the Bible speaking clearly and uh, consistently compelling about providing a, a safe, loving environment. God has created us with a sense of community, right? It's not good for a person to be alone. And so if a same-sex attracted person can't find it in the church, well, then they're going to try to find it somewhere else, right? And so we bear some responsibility for that. Not just, of course, for same sex, but for single people and for other people who are marginalized. And so there are lots of texts that talk about the community being, the church being that kind of caring community, which, which kind of wins people over. Some of us know the story of Rosaria Butterfield. So this is a kind of a striking story. It's a few years old. And as I remember it, she was like an extreme feminist, lesbian, English professor. And, and, and you know, she, she kind of meets a pastor. And she's like, her first reaction is, oh, you know. And, and yet this guy doesn't want to argue with her. He just invites her over to their place for meals. And, and so what I'm trying to say, maybe not so elegantly, is he just kind of wins her over simply with his love, his care, his compassion. And so that's the kind of thing that the church needs to, to kind of hear. And maybe I could say this too. I think it relates to the same thing. The more the right, I, and I, I'm probably speaking to mostly conservative people tonight, right? Uh, I don't always. Uh, I've been in some hostile environment. But the, the harder we go this way, the easier it becomes for those on the left to say, see, you know what I mean? They don't really care about gays and lesbians and so forth, right? So that's why if you're going to affirm, you know, what Scripture says on this, you also have to think more seriously about embracing people within our church community. I mean, 
Same-sex attracted people who are committed to living a holy life, which would be a celibate life, right, are, are and ought to be fully eligible for offices in the church and full membership and should be treated warmly. And so some of us maybe need to kind of just broaden our horizon a little bit, right, to think a little bit differently about this. I'm a little bit nervous because some people might have the right answer from my point of view, but they don't know really how we got the right answer. In other words... They're just against this, but they don't know the biblical evidence supporting that. That's not a healthy situation either, right, to be in. So the other side is true too. If The, the more the, the progressives want to really push hard, right, on being tolerant, I think it only emboldens the right. See, see what happens if we open a little bit? And, and so uh, there are some dangers, brothers and sisters, you know, in these extreme positions. And, uh, and so I'm trying to do justice, and the report tries to do justice to both truth and love. Both of them. Another question here. This kind of came up at our class this meeting. Most churches struggle with getting members to agree to serve on council. If recommendation D passes, the confessional status portion, presumably elders, deacons, and pastors who have same-sex attracted family members risk being deposed from office if they attend or support their family members' weddings. What advice do you have for pastors and councils in this regard? Should we discourage those with same-sex attracted family members from allowing their name to stand for office? So, like many things uh, for Christians, right, you can have a truth, but then the tricky part is how do you implement the truth? And usually how you try to implement the truth comes down to a very important word, and that's called wisdom. Because it isn't a law. It's like, if this is this, then this is that. I mean, there isn't like, we, the committee didn't sit down and give you like 49 different scenarios, and in each scenario, here's the answer. I mean, that's impossible to do. And so, it seems to me that the church, I'm talking about the broad church, needs to be somewhat gracious in these complex situations, right? Now, there are some obvious things. If you're a pastor and According to the report's conviction, you, should you serve at a, should you officiate at a same-sex wedding? That, that's kind of an open and shut case. That's a no-brainer, right? But then, wait a minute, what if one of your children, right? That gets a little more complex. Is it possible for your child still to know your position on this? Can you still be, so to say, opposed to their lifestyle, but yet participate in a way that still honors the relationship you have? I mean, those are kind of more gray areas. And I imagine that some people will have different answers than you do, right? And then the tricky part is not to somehow accuse those others, right, of doing... So that's where we have to be a little bit... Gray. I'm not trying to duck the question, but I'm just saying there are lots of complex situations. I mean, you started off by saying if they have a same-sex attracted child, well, that shouldn't invalidate them. But then you said, you know, but participate in their wedding, you know, and see... So... I don't remember that specifically from no, the, the report, report. But that's, I've heard that brought up. That, yeah, so that, the, re, so the a council re, member could come under discipline for attending? No, the, the report yeah. doesn't uh, spell out any of those specific okay. I didn't remember uh, that anymore, consequences I didn't at all, right? Implying. But there's mm-hmm. no question that if the report is passed and the confessional status is passed, that, that's, that's going to require some, some, some careful wisdom. reflection, mm-hmm. right? Of course, if it's not passed, that's going to require some careful reflection too, right? So it's not like we have an easy way and a hard way. Uh, we just have a hard way, no matter what, yeah. I'm afraid. Absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of that comes around what we just was just asked, and there was several questions on this, so I'm going to ask one of them. Uh, confessional status, why does that matter? Why is it important for us? What's going to be the effect if that portion passes? What will be the effect if it's not passed? So I guess it's the question's asking you to anticipate what synod does with section D. Yeah. So the shrewdest people in our denomination, when I say shrewd, I mean, you know, people who are kind of looking at the situation and calculating it out. From the get-go, they right away saw that it's this last piece that really is the most important. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would dare say that there are some people, they could say the church can do whatever it wants with the rest of the report, right? But we just don't want to pass that confessional status because that means now suddenly... I or my church can't disagree or do something different, you know, or continue in our own way. And so um, I'm not surprised, you know, that that's a sticking point. And it will be hard. I mean, there are a number of pastors, and some have come out, not as same-sex attracted, but come out as affirming. Mm -hmm. 
and you've kind of put your name out there, and then what if the church went the other way? What are you going to do now? I mean, people are going to say, are you going to honor that? Or are you going to change your view? I mean, that's, that's going to be a hard situation, right? What about office bearers? So um, I didn't say this was going to be easy. But again, if we don't take an action, that's going to have consequences too. Because if indeed the scriptures are clear, consistent, and compelling, and the church doesn't make it a confessional issue, there are a number of brothers and sisters in our denomination who say, now wait a minute, um, you know, I don't know if I can have fellowship with someone who so differs on a substantive issue than I do, right? And so we're going to have a tension and possible splits either way. I have sensed, you know, that, that, that there's a huge aversion to division. I mean, well, I mean, that's good, it's understandable, but it's like, oh no, we don't want to be divided. Uh, and I'm just a little bit nervous that the fear of being divided is somehow greater than the fear of maybe not being faithful to Scripture or something like that, right? I, I, I'm just, again, I don't hear, I'm not eager for division, right? This is not, not an easy thing to say, but I'm just saying that um, it's a significant issue and, and you need to think carefully about, about some, of these, some of these things. And I don't know. I, we, we have office bearers, of course, now who don't believe everything that we consider confessional. I hate to say that, right? I mean, it shouldn't be that way. In other words, we probably have some elders who maybe don't believe in infant baptism. We probably have some elders, you know, who have a more Arminian approach, right? That's not right, okay? But at least we don't have on paper, like the church's official teaching doesn't reflect those positions, right? So what I'm saying, or what I guess the report is saying is, now what's the church's official teaching going to be, right? And then we'll have to work out the others, right? I mean... Some of that maybe people just serve out their term and then they'll say to themselves, maybe I guess I won't serve again because my views are different, right? I don't know what they'll say. Maybe they'll reconsider and change their view. Maybe they'll leave. Uh, th these are things that we'll, of course, have to see how it all kind of pans out. So either way, if it's approved, if Section D is approved or not, there's, it's, it's not going to be fun. Well, I mean, I'm kind of guessing, you know, uh, I could imagine, for instance, that the report passes and the confessional passes, right? Mm -hmm. I still think that actually a good number of revisionists, I'll say, will still not leave because they'll say, well, maybe the church will change its view next year. Or the church has a pretty good track record of not kind of practicing discipline. So even though on paper, right, oh, we'll just see if a church dares to, do, or classes, I mean, so... I don't know exactly what the church is going to decide. I don't know what the fallout will be, but there are a variety of ways in which this can, uh, can kind of fall out. And again, none of them are exciting or encouraging for a denomination whose numbers are not growing. Right? I, I said to you and I earlier, we can't afford, right? I mean, this, these, these splits and attrition, no. Another question here. Of all the sins that we commit, including the list in 1 Corinthians 6, why is homosexuality so egregious that we need to... Did you read this one? Well, I, I already Have think... those <laughs> who practice it from fully participating in our church. I think, okay. that's, I, think I got it. Well, I think that's right. I mean, we're kind of hypocrites right. because in the list it mentions the greedy. Okay, and somehow we're, you know... I never heard of anybody in the church disciplined for being too greedy, you know, right? Uh, in fact, actually, sometimes we kind of secretly admire them, you know, because they're so successful or something. So, so maybe instead of changing our view on homosexuality, we should change our, our view on being greedy. Another one is gossiping. I mean, you know, uh, gossiping to an extreme level, well, then you're kind of killing your brother or your sister. I mean, so maybe instead of compromising our view on that, we should take more seriously the other. Because all of them, if you heard the quote, the beginning of that vice list and the end of the vice list says, these are things that you will not inherit the kingdom of God. I sometimes say good speakers never say the same thing twice. Good speakers never say the same thing twice. Oh, <laughs> oh unless they want to emphasize something. And so this vice list is, you know, that it, it's... I mean, some people have accused the report of making this too serious, but I mean, the scriptures here in the 1 Corinthians uh, passage, but other passages too, say that this, this, is, this is an important matter, yeah. Pastoral care question here. Mm -hmm. What is the church going to do about our children, right? I think a lot of people are thinking about kids they know that have come out, who love God but are claiming that they are homosexual. They are leaving because there is no place for them. Okay. 
So the big question in this particular thing is, not that they're same-sex attracted, but do they have permission to act on that same-sex attraction, right? So just the fact that they're same-sex attracted, that doesn't disqualify them for anything. I mean, you know, they, they still are beloved children of parents, and there's still full opportunity for membership in the church. That's what the church needs to work on, right? Now, if the next thing is, okay, but then they're practicing, well, it seems to me that family members and church should still love them, but it's another matter of whether we will accept, I mean, the, the practice, right? I do know, I've, I met one, uh, one tearful mother uh, who said, um, my child is same-sex attracted, and they said, if you love me, then you have to accept me. That's where it gets tricky. Do you catch? So, so love and acceptance are like this, right? Whereas I'd like to believe that you can love someone but still not, I mean, take out homosexuality, right? There, we should still love other people who have ideas and beliefs and practices that we don't hold on to, right? So um, I don't know if you have to read the question again. Maybe just, a, I mean, pastoral care, I mean, I guess, by the way, the, the, I told you one member on our committee had a more authentic voice on this discussion than I do or anyone else, right? I said that to the committee because this is a person who is same-sex attracted. And this person did the lion's share, did the most part on the pastoral mm -hmm. care. So I'm just trying to say that the sensibilities, right, the pastoral component, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully come out from a person who's been there and is doing it right now. I mean, you know, they've they felt that attraction for a long time. They actually lived out that attraction in the past, but then realized that Scripture didn't allow for that, okay? Wow. So those are possibilities too, mm -hmm. right? I mean, all the stories, remember I told you, there are multiple stories. You shouldn't hear only one kind of story. Yes, there are stories of where the church rejected a person and, and uh, treated them terribly, and so we kind of drove them out of the church, and then they find fellowship in another community, and, and those are, are, are sad stories to hear, right? But there are other stories, not even dramatic ones like Rosaria Butterfield, right? I didn't finish the story. She became a Jesus believer and left her lesbian lover. And I mean, you know, a totally different story. There, we shouldn't underestimate, you know, the transforming power of God's grace. I mean, sometimes we're surprised. I don't know why. We, we say it from preachers, you know, but it actually is true, right? Yeah. They're living, breathing examples. And so anyway, uh, there, there's just a finality about the statement, you know, that yeah. I'm a little bit uncomfortable with. And right. I'm saying, wait a minute. There's, there's a lot more there, right, for us to think about and try to work through in a way that you can still love your child, right, and be supportive of your child, but maybe not, you The know, difficulty accept, comes yeah. in the fact that this is so tied to identity and yeah, personhood. And so if you re reject this aspect of me or don't accept that, you reject me entirely, yeah. right? And I think that's where the rub is right now. And how do we reconcile that? No, I absolutely do love you. But I don't accept that part of right. it. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is helpful or not, but I, I've had this a lot where people will talk about my son or my daughter or my grandchild, okay? Um, I've just thought to myself, I sure hope that my faith, okay, my convictions aren't determined or dependent on the conduct of my children and my grandchildren. I love my kids. I love my grandchildren, okay? And it's going to pain me, but... I just hope that suddenly because let's just change the equation. Now, you know, my grandson doesn't believe in God, okay, or something like that. Okay, I can still love him, but yeah. that doesn't mean I'm going to say suddenly it's okay, okay. You know, I have no concerns about you, right. right? So I'm just asking parents, yes, I, 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 understand, I feel your pain, <laughs> right? But um, does it require you giving up? you know, the convictions of your faith. I mean, where is that line going to be if it's not homosexuality? You know, is there anything your child could do or say that you would finally have to say, like, you know, I'm sorry, but, mm -hmm. you know, this isn't, this isn't pleasing to God and I'm concerned right. about your eternal destiny. Well, <laughs> part of the assumption is if you only knew somebody or if you only had a family member, then yeah. you, would, you, would, you would look at Scripture differently but you've you've cited other examples and there's pastors in the crc that have yeah. said they're same-sex attracted they're committed to a celibate lifestyle and congregants and uh it is possible we just often don't hear those stories elevated and in the healthy examples of pastoral right. care as well we hear often about the destructive ones um so remember my motto mm -hmm. is the longer i am the better i'd better be <laughs> 
the longer I, I am, the better I better be. So. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, you know, we have to, <laughs> yeah. we have to honor time commitments yep. a little bit here. So, so we're gonna, I'm going to ask <laughs> one more, and then we will close in prayer, if that's okay. Um, this is, a, I think, a reference to the report on page 114, article uh, 13. I don't think you have it memorized, so I'll give you some context. Uh, it's uh, pastoral care section, homosexuality. It says, um, word, a word to churches, three practical ways to make church inclusive. Uh, model leadership by godly single members. Seek out for service as elders, deacons, and pastors. Those who are single and or who are known to be attracted to the same sex and celibate. Why would we allow per, a person who commit, admits that they are homosexual lesbian to train our children or lead people in our churches? Uh -huh. So again, the big key to that statement is it depends on whether that person is acting out on that orientation or not, all right? So let me just backtrack a little bit. Remember, the, the pastoral exhortation is to the church and the leaders. So I just wonder, us pastors, how often in our congregational prayer do we just even mention same-sex attracted people, right? That would be at least a first, you know, that they exist and they're in our midst, right? So that's one way to do it, right? A little more aggressive way is if you have a member in your church who's same-sex attracted, right? A member in good standing and so forth, right? And therefore, they are eligible for office. Maybe it would be a bold move. It depends on the confidence of the church. You say, well, maybe we should... Think about this person serving as an office bearer because then they become a positive example of how a person with same-sex attraction living a holy life, a holy life to which we're all called, right? And we're kind of showing in a public way that, that such a person is accepted and their gifts and stuff are met. So, so again, none of this is easy, but these are ways in which the church can take steps, still affirming its belief, but still also being that, that, that kind of caring, compassionate community that we've always been called to be, right? So, I, I, again, none of this is easy, but I think that's a healthy step. It's certainly a lot better than just pretending they don't exist right. or shutting them out. I mean, that, that's everything that the report is, is, is against on that. So, Well, thank you so much. Can we show our gratitude to Dr. Wyma for being here with us tonight? Okay. All right, I'm going to close with a word of prayer and just a reminder that there is uh, some cookies and decaf coffee and water and all that out there. Thank you to the, the people here at Hillcrest who served to put this together, serving in the sound booth here and, and put the, the, the cookies and all that out there for us and, and gathered all of that. Uh, Dr. Wyman will hang around up here if you want to uh, spend a little bit of time with him. Uh, he said he had a couple of lectures today and oral comps and even went for a run this morning, so we'll try to honor your time. And you can also email him. Uh, it's wymaje at calvinseminary.edu if you can't read that. And I think that's available on your website too. They can contact you through jeffreywyma.com uh, if you want to get a hold of him and ask any follow-up questions. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be here tonight to gather and to think deeply about things that concern you. Lord, you are a holy God and you call us to live holy lives. And it is complex to do so in a world where most, of, most people are catechized and formed by the culture around them. And even within your church, more and more people are not aware of what your word says about these issues. And if they are, there's, there's also people trying to reinterpret them and, and move in ways that are, not, that are contrary to your word. Uh, so God, we thank you for the, the clarity you helped provide through this study committee, through Dr. Wyma's work. I thank you for his uh, generosity with his time tonight uh, to be here with us and to help edify your church. And God, we do pray for the Christian Reformed Church uh, we have a very important synod coming up this year. Uh, it is going to be an incredibly painful moment in a lot of ways, and no matter what is decided, there's going to be people who maybe feel that they can no longer stay in our denomination. But God, we pray that your grace would fall upon the proceedings, that your word would ring true, and that true unity, wor unity around your word would prevail. God, I thank you for all those that were able to be here tonight, those listening online. We pray that you'd keep them safe on the roads as they head back to their homes. We pray that they would uh, be able to take what they've learned tonight and use them in their congregations. And Lord, that they would be able to love those that struggle with sexual sins in all of its forms. 
Uh, Lord, I pray that you would allow us to, to minister the gospel of hope and grace, that you, Lord, are, are doing a good work in our lives. And not only do you justify us through your Holy Spirit, but you sanctify us and allow us to grow in holiness. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, and together we say, amen. Thanks for coming. Amen. Mm-hmm.